Something really strange happens towards the end of MGS4. You probably didn't notice because they're pretty sneaky about it, but pay close attention to what Ocelot says right here. The people will fight. And through battle, they will know the fullness of life. At last, our Father's will is out in heaven. is complete. The first few times I saw this scene, I didn't think it was that big a deal. But about eight years after the game came out, I watched it again, and my reaction was something a little more appropriate. Uh, what the fuck is that? The problem is that Ocelot's description doesn't line up with any version of Outer Heaven we've seen before. It just doesn't make any sense. After Naked Snake was forced to kill the only person he ever cared about, he started noticing that soldiers were quickly abandoned by their governments after they served their purpose. He saw all the combat veterans struggling to get jobs and having difficulty adjusting to civilian life upon returning home, not to mention the complete lack of support for people suffering from PTSD. To make matters worse, Zero had made Big Boss into a figurehead for military propaganda. So whenever a poster with Big Boss's face on it convinced somebody to join the armed forces, he was condemning them to the very fate he wanted to put a stop to. The last straw was when Zero kickstarted Les Enfants Terribles. Les Enfants Terribles. When Big Boss woke up from a coma and found out he'd been cloned without his permission, he realized Zero wasn't interested in collaborating to shape the new world. He only wanted to use Big Boss as a puppet. And with two little kids running around with his face, Big Boss had no way of objecting to Zero's plans. Before, Big John at least had the option of dying to keep from being exploited, but Zero took even that away from him. That's when Big Boss decided to rebel against his homeland and form his own country. A place where soldiers like him wouldn't be taken advantage of the way they were under Zero's system. The main takeaway here is that Outer Heaven was meant to be a place where soldiers could always have a place in society. A country made for soldiers, by soldiers. You with me? So what the hell is this? America will descend into chaos. It'll be the Wild West all over again. No law, no order. Ocelot was there to help create Outer Heaven every step of the way. He understood the purpose behind Big Boss's military nation more than anyone. So how could Ocelot possibly mess it up? The practical answer to that question is that the writer of this game forgot what the entire point of Outer Heaven was. And I say the writer because I'm not really convinced Metal Gear's storyline was the brainchild of just one person. Look, I gotta draw a line in the sand here. There's just no chance that a writer ever forgets an essential piece of their own lore like that. Anyway, from an unimaginative standpoint, the explanation for the screw-up is simply because the writer forgot. Everybody who's given up on looking into this any further, you can do it way the hell over there. As the lore keeper, my job is to fill in any remaining plot holes in this series using whatever canon intel I can find. So back to the topic at hand. What the hell is Ocelot talking about? Some of you might be thinking that it was actually Liquid's persona that said all that stuff. It wasn't. But even if it was, Liquid accurately describes Outer Heaven to Snake at the end of MGS1. What are you really after? A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were. As we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish. Both Ocelot and Liquid perfectly understood what Big Boss intended for Outer Heaven to be, so there's no way either of them could misinterpret it. Involving innocent civilians in the chaos was never part of the plan. In other words, the Outer Heaven that Ocelot describes at the end of MGS4 is completely different from what El Gerente Gordo had in mind. Strangely enough though, Ocelot says this during his speech. At last, our father's will is out of heaven is complete. In English, he specifically says our father's will, which would lead you to believe that this is Liquid's personality speaking. But let me explain why that can't be the case. During the fight, Snake literally beats the liquid out of Ocelot. That's got a double meaning, you see, because blood is a type of liquid, right? Besides that, though, you actually see Ocelot's personality re-emerge during the last phase of the fight. You can tell his personality has reverted back to normal because he does his trademark hand gesture, something Liquid would never be caught dead doing. I looked at this cutscene in Japanese to see if anything was lost in translation, and in that version, Ocelot says father's will, not our father's will. That's an important distinction, because in English, Ocelot's using a term that indicates a familial relationship. In Japanese, however, Ocelot's using a title that you would actually call your dad. Okay, sure, Liquid used the same word to refer to Big Boss in the Japanese version of MGS1. And when Ocelot was pretending to be Liquid, he definitely used the term our father to refer to Big Boss throughout MGS4. 
So you could argue that the writer intended for Liquid to be talking during this scene, but that still doesn't explain why the definition of Outer Heaven completely changed all of a sudden. It can't be Liquid talking because during the last phase of the fight, the health bar clearly reads Ocelot. He does the hand gesture, it says Ocelot, it's Ocelot. Liquid's personality is completely gone. Ah, but what about Snake's health bar, you ask? It says Naked Snake by the end of the fight, but that doesn't mean Snake reverted back to his father. Obviously, this whole thing was just a poetic nod to the previous games in the series, right? Sure, fine. But I think that undersells the interesting dynamic that emerges during this fight. These are Ocelot's final moments, and he knows that. So this is a trip down memory lane as he relives the event where it all began. In the end, he says goodbye to his friend John the only way he can by allowing himself to be killed by one of Big Boss's clones. Snake never saw Ocelot from 1964, so the flashbacks of a young Adam are just there for the player's benefit to make it clear what's going on. Unless this sequence, and for that matter the entire game, is being shown from Ocelot's perspective. His life is literally flashing before his eyes leading up to his death. But I can't get into that right now, that's another video. Point is, it's Ocelot who delivers this speech at the end of the game. So when he describes that weird version of Outer Heaven and says that's his father's will, there's only one way to get that scene to make sense. The only way this scene works is if Ocelot's talking about his actual father. Let me say that again, okay? Literally the only logical place Ocelot could have gotten that twisted vision of Outer Heaven from is the sorrow. But in order for that to be true, Ocelot would have had to know exactly who his parents were. And of course he did, he's Revolver fucking Ocelot. I was surprised to learn that a lot of people who consider themselves Metal Gear fans don't know that the Sorrow is Ocelot's dad, so let's clear that up. In MGS3, if you call Eva after a certain encounter with Ocelot, you'll be treated to this little morsel. Eva, I wanted to ask you about Ocelot. Yeah, I know. He's pretty infatuated with you, isn't he? That's not what I meant. Aren't the Ocelots an elite unit? Yeah. So how'd he get to be their commander? He can't be any older than 18 or 19. I can't believe he's already a major. I heard from the colonel that he's been given special treatment. Special treatment? Yeah, he's the son of some legendary hero or something. Mm, no wonder he seems to have the right stuff. So who is this legendary hero anyway? Beats me. Mm. The colonel never told me. All I heard was that his mother was supposedly shot in the gut during battle and that he was born right there with bullets whizzing past them. A pregnant woman in the middle of a battle? That's what I heard. They say that when they stitched her up, the scar was shaped like a snake. And then, before the final battle at the end of the game, the boss reveals the scar in her chest and explains. I was pregnant at the time. The sorrow was the father. I gave birth on the field of battle. A beautiful baby boy. But my child was snatched away from me by the philosophers. Pretty cool, right? So how could Ocelot have known who his parents were? Because Ocelot's just that kind of badass motherfucker, man. I wouldn't be surprised if it was his idea for his mom and dad to hook up like some John Connor type shit, all right? Dude's just on another level. As if he had planned it from the beginning, Ocelot conveniently shows up almost right after Snake's final battle with the boss. He couldn't have been that far from the fight if he was going to catch up to the sea bus that Snake and Eva took off in. So there's a good chance he was able to catch a glimpse of the boss as he flew by on that hover majank. Eva speaks as if all the officers under Colonel Volgan's command knew the story about how Ocelot was born. A major is only two ranks below a colonel, so I can't imagine there was a lot of intel that Ocelot didn't have access to. Besides that, he's not an idiot. He'd be fully aware of the reasons why he was being given special treatment, and once he saw the boss's snake-shaped scar, he'd be able to put two and two together. But that's some basic level stuff. We need to go deeper. In MGS5, it's revealed that Operation Snake Eater wasn't a solo sneaking mission. Skullface and a team of XOF agents were tasked with following Snake around to make sure the operation went smoothly. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, sometimes as a mole or a scout, sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail, making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. So everything Snake saw was also seen by Skullface, which was then reported directly to Zero. A decade later, when Big Boss fell into a coma after MSF was attacked by a rogue Skullface, it was Zero who decided to create Big Boss's doppelganger, Venom. 
To make Venom think he was the real deal, Zero had Ocelot implant the memories of Big Boss's past missions into Venom's consciousness. That especially meant Operation Snake Eater, since without the traumatic memory of killing his mentor, Big Boss doesn't exist in the first place. Ocelot would have seen everything Snake experienced in MGS3 while he was transferring those memories to Venom. That means the conversation with Eva about the day he was born, the boss explaining that the sorrow was her baby daddy, and the snake scar. That scar is doubly important since Big Boss replicates it in Peace Walker, which is another memory that Ocelot would have given to Venom. Honestly, there's tons of great evidence that Ocelot knew about his parentage, and I would present that evidence if Ocelot hadn't planned the entire series from the beginning. All of it. Ocelot orchestrated and manipulated every single actor in every single event throughout the timeline to achieve his goals. So how'd he do it? Ocelot's like a walking, talking Rube Goldberg machine. He collects puzzle pieces until he's ready to set things into motion. Then, once all the cards have been placed, he brings the whole house crashing down in one giant chain reaction. He's the kind of dude that'll set something up months in advance, only for it to pay off decades later. Let me show you what I mean. Some way, somehow, Ocelot finds a way to get right up next to every major mastermind on the planet. Between 1964 and 2009, if anybody had a plan to take over the world, Ocelot was conveniently their right-hand man. Until, of course, all the pieces were in place and Ocelot was able to set his own plan into motion. Throughout Ocelot's career, he would pretend to be a subservient underling so he could get close to the head honcho. Then he'd use subliminal messaging and the power of suggestion to plan ideas in that person's head. This would make the person in charge think that whatever scheme Ocelot was feeding them was actually their own original thought. So you got all these dudes thinking they're gonna take over the world when they're actually just doing Ocelot's bidding the whole time. Every move Ocelot made throughout the series was done to prepare for his insurrection. Essentially, he was playing the long game for 50 years. It all started in 1964. At that time, Ocelot was actually working for the CIA while he was undercover as one of Volgan's henchmen. At the end of MGS3, he reveals that he was fully aware of the boss's mission. As the CIA's main contact in the Soviet Union, he was in a perfect position to suggest the entire scenario to the Director of Central Intelligence. Here's how I see it going down. America wants to recover the philosopher's legacy from Volgan, right? So Ocelot calls his boss back in the States and he's like, Yo, I got an idea. What if the boss defected to the Soviet Union? And the director's like, what? That's insane. I'm old and fat. Yeah, you're probably right, Ocelot says. I mean, Colonel Vulcan wouldn't even buy it unless he was distracted with some ridiculous toy to play with anyway. What do you mean, a ridiculous toy? You know, like a weapon of mass destruction he could hold in his hands. Vulcan's superficial like that. Dude's definitely overcompensating. But it'd have to be something crazy overkill, like... I don't know, an experimental piece of tech that never got put into production because it just barely passed quality control, something like that, I don't know. We do have those Davy Crockett's collecting dust in a warehouse somewhere. A Davy Crockett? Bruh, Vulcan would go nuts for that. Ah, oh, but he's a loose cannon. If anybody gave Vulcan a weapon like that, well, you know what would happen. Yeah, yes, <clears throat> of course, I know. I just want to make sure you know, also. Well, sir, I'd wager he'd blow up a piece of his own country. Like a research lab or something. Then he'd blame the whole thing on us true-blooded Americans. Wait, how would he blame it on us? Yeah, remember there's that Soviet scientist affecting to America on Monday? The agent going to extract him is doing the first halo jump, and Soviet radar would catch the plane in their airspace, they'd assume it was there to do a bombing run. But that would start World War III! <laughs> I know, right? What a disaster! In order to prevent mutually assured destruction, President Johnson would have to throw the boss under the bus. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I don't. Look, in order to prove that we weren't responsible for firing the Davy Crockett, we'd have to take the boss out ourselves. But before that, the boss would be able to get closer to Vulcan and retrieve the legacy. Yeah, but the only way Khrushchev would be convinced was if the boss was killed by somebody close to her. Like, uh, an apprentice or something. <sighs> Man, can you imagine? You'd have to be some kind of super genius tactician to direct a mission like that. Now, oh, well. Anyway, I gotta go do some more communism. I'll talk to you later, Mr. Director. Now imagine a conversation like that going down every time Ocelot's in the room with somebody in a leadership position. Which is always. Ocelot's never not hanging out with a dude in charge. But it wasn't just high-ranking government officials that Ocelot manipulated. He used Inception to plant ideas into the heads of everyone around him. You tend to twist your elbow to absorb the recoil. That's more of a revolver technique. Ocelot has, like, perfect geometric spatial awareness or some shit. Before this scene, he demonstrated his ability to do advanced trigonometry and ballistics calculations in his head, on the fly. So this is a perfect example of Ocelot putting on an act in order to convince someone that his idea is actually their original thought. 
Later on, when Ocelot shows up with a single action army, he makes it look like Snake gave him the inspiration for the Switch. But it's blatantly obvious that Ocelot's plan was to make Revolvers his trademark from the beginning. The first time we see him, he's twirling a Makarov, and you're gonna tell me he's never had the thought to use a revolver before? Get the f*** out of here with that. Keep the change, you filthy animal. Throughout the game, Ocelot shapes the weak-minded Colonel Vulgan like so much steroid-laden Play-Doh. When Vulgan goes to fire the Davy Crockett, for example, Ocelot pleads with him to reconsider, knowing that any attempt to dissuade Vulgan is only gonna push him one step closer to pulling the trigger. Gifting the Davy Crockett to Vulgan was part of the plan to gain his trust, which would have been Adam's idea in the first place, and he knew exactly what to say to the Colonel to get him to fire the thing. After the credits roll in MGS3, Ocelot tells the DCI about the Metal Gear project, so the US can start development of its own walking death mobile. If he hadn't said anything, Granin's plans might have been completely lost to time. Instead, he made sure innovations in Metal Gear technology would progress for decades, until a time came when he'd need to commandeer a Metal Gear of his own. No, not the Ray unit, but Outer Haven, a Metal Gear in the form of a battleship. A similar conversation takes place in Portable Ops. After the credits, Zero gets on the phone with Ocelot to recruit him into the Patriots. Ocelot agrees, but only on the condition that Big Boss joins the organization with him. Ocelot was the loyal second-in-command of every final boss throughout the series, pulling strings and putting pieces together until he could realize his magnum opus in 2014. To achieve this, Ocelot would have needed a way to guarantee that his plans would go off without a hitch. That's where the VR simulations come into play. Ocelot would have had them made to ensure that everybody played their part without deviating from the script. But that doesn't even scratch the surface of Ocelot's genius, because he would have had to know how every single person involved was going to react. That'd give him some insane predictive abilities. Borderline paranormal abilities, you might say. Well, not quite. Ocelot says it himself. There's no such thing as miracles or the supernatural. Only cutting edge technology. I'm not gonna get into the details of the precise abilities Ocelot would need to have to pull this off, but I will in due time. So if you don't want to miss it, you know what to do. You know. I think the more important question for the time being is why. What were Ocelot's motivations for everything he did leading up to his insurrection? What if Ocelot knew about his parents even before the events of MGS3? What if Ocelot was visited by his father's ghost, just like Snake was? Wait, scratch that. What if Ocelot was able to meet his father in person while he was still alive? The boss was forced to kill the Sorrow in 1962, but that was 18 years after Ocelot was born. Both Ocelot and the Sorrow were Russian operatives, and the Sorrow achieved mythical status in his home country as a member of the Cobra unit. So what if the legendary hero Eva was talking about wasn't the boss? What if Ocelot rose up through the ranks because he was revered as the son of the legendary spirit medium soldier? As a highly valued military asset, the Sorrow had tons of political power and he had more than enough opportunities to pull some strings and move his son up the ladder. But even if the philosophers were able to completely prevent any contact between Ocelot and his parents, and as you can see they were not, Ocelot knew about the boss's suicide mission from the start, the most cloak and dagger black ops mission of the entire Cold War. In other words, Ocelot had the security clearance to know the details of the mission, including the personal files of all the agents set to participate. That meant previous mission reports, debriefings, psychological evaluations, and of course, hospital records. Even if 90% of the file was redacted, all Ocelot would have to do is glance at the boss's medical history to figure out who his parents were. That makes for some pretty good drama, depending on how you look at it. Ocelot knowingly sent his mother to die so he could eventually make the sorrow and the joy's dream a reality. He plotted for over 50 years, carefully orchestrating events until the time was right. That is some heavy stuff. Let me blow your mind real quick, check this out. In the early 1970s, Ocelot suggests to Zero that the Patriots turn Big Boss into their mascot. After all, the Patriots were formed to realize the boss's will, and John knew her better than anyone. Then Ocelot plants the idea in Snake's head that Zero's a control freak, and the world he's trying to build isn't what the boss really wanted. So Snake starts distancing himself from the rest of the group, which causes Zero to worry that the Patriots are about to lose their figurehead. So Ocelot goes back and he's like, Hey there, Major, I've been taking French classes at the local community college, and, uh, well, then Zero's all like, Hello, Poppy, what's all this then? Then Ocelot goes, Les enfants terribles! Les enfants terribles! So Ocelot gives Zero the idea to make clones of Big Boss, and he does this knowing it'll be the last straw that makes Double B go rogue. Big Boss's vision of Outer Heaven was supposedly misinterpreted from the boss, but Ocelot planned for that to happen so that he could perfect the idea of Outer Heaven decades later. In order to prevent nuclear war with Russia, certain details about the mission had to be made public. The boss had to be blamed for Vulgan firing the Davy Crockett, and after she was labeled a traitor, Snake was sent in to handle it. But as we all know, that was just a cover-up. 
None of that cover-up would have stuck unless Snake being given the title of Big Boss was known throughout the military circles of the world. Zero took advantage of this fact when he made Big Boss into a figurehead for his organization. All of this, from beginning to end, was meticulously planned by Ocelot as part of his machinations. And what do you know? When the president gives Snake his big shiny medal, look who's standing right outside the window. But what was Ocelot's ultimate goal? Well, to know that, you have to understand the ideologies of his parents, the sorrow, and the joy. That's coming up in the next one. If you want to speed the process along, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can also get involved by following us at the links you see on your screen. Till next time, gearheads.